My name is Monk Rowe, and we are in New York City filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm extremely pleased to have Annie Ross with me this Thank evening. You. I'm happy to be here. Well, I appreciate it so much. Um, you're an actress and a, a vocalist, and uh, you've been on numerous continents working. I'm a singer. You're a singer. And I'm a writer. I'm a lyricist. I'm an author. Let's see, what should we talk about first? I just learned, if, if I can ask, a, a, an interesting thing in our, in, before the cameras were rolling, that you came through Ellis Island. Yes, I did. I was five. Uh -huh. And I came over with my mother and father from Scotland. Steerage, of course, mm -hmm. which was the lowest fare that you could get. Uh, and then from here, where I, in New York, where I stayed, for about six months, uh, I won a contest that got me a job in Hollywood. So I was raised there. Do you have any memory of the the trip? Over? Oh, absolutely. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess five years old, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I was pretty precocious, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I'm writing it all down in my book. Good which will give all the details. Yeah, it was a big adventure at the time. Oh, it was going to Hollywood, you know, it was going to America and you're mm -hmm. going to be a star and you're going to go to Hollywood. And Because I used to sing and dance yeah. and, you know. In, um, in your home before you came over, you said you were precocious and were you singing and doing all My that? My mother and you? father had an act. Oh, okay. We were, I had three brothers and at that time, my little sister wasn't born. But uh, we used to work uh, bandstands in the park. And then my father would pass the hat. So we all had to do something. Someone uh -huh. would, you know, we didn't have tickets because we weren't that rich to print tickets. So, uh, but we all played a part in the show. My mother was a comedian and sang. And my father sang and my brother sang. So. It was a natural kind of, you know, development. What kind of songs would, would you have sung? Songs that my father wrote. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'd pretend I was lost. I'd walk up to the uh, little bandstand and pretend I was lost. And, and the, the, there was a, an actor playing a policeman and he was chewing on a big Danish or something. And I would say, you know, I'm hungry and I'm lost. And, and he'd say, well, if I give you a bite of this, what can you do? And I'd say, oh, I can sing and I can dance. And at which point my father would play an, ar play an arpeggio on the accordion and I'd start to sing. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. And, and then when you got to New York, you must have been in some kind of uh, contest for child actresses. Yeah, um, I had a little playmate in the building I was staying in, and uh, she told me her father had a radio show. So when her father walked in, I said I should be on it. And it was a contest for children, and the man was Paul Whiteman. It was Paul Whiteman? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I won. I had a kilt and a Glengarry and all those Scottish things. And I went out to Hollywood. And my mother thought I was going to be, you know, a Shirley Temple. Well, they already had a Shirley Temple. Uh -huh. So I just settled down and went to school. Mm -hmm. Did you go out there with a family member? I went out with my mother, and uh -huh. then she had to go back and take care of the other kids. So I was raised under the guardianship oh. of an aunt mm -hmm. who was also a singer called Ella Logan. Oh, Ella, yes, I've read yeah. the name. Mm -hmm. She was in Finian's Rainbow, and, mm -hmm. and she scattered, and she sang with Leo Watson, and, you know. Did you get into, into film, films out there at that time? I did one uh, Little Rascals film. Yeah where I sang a swing version of Loch Lomond. And then my aunt said, no, you have to go to school. 
And then I did a film with Judy Garland, I think I was about 11. And then my aunt again said, no, you gotta go to school. So I, although I didn't complete my schooling, mm -hmm. instead I came here to New York, went to the American Academy of Dramatic Art, mm -hmm. uh, and then left for Europe to rejoin my family. But uh, there was never ever, ever any doubt in my mind as to what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew I was gonna be in the business. And yeah. It was in your blood then. Yeah, yeah, it was. D um, have you ever seen, do you have copies of those early things you were in? I suppose somewhere I do, but I don't really look at them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to look at them again when you write your book, maybe. Well, you know, I'm in the process of doing is, that Are now. you doing it? Mm. Great. And so you, you say your family went back to Europe and, and you followed. Back to Scotland. Uh-huh. No, I didn't see them until I was 17. Wow. And then I stayed a couple of weeks and went down to London. Mm -hmm. Got a job in a club, bought a second-hand dress, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> Can you recall what um, kind of wages you were working for back then? Oh, yes, yeah, seven pound, 10 a week. And that translates to about that about 10 bucks a week. <laughs> but I didn't care. Yeah. You know, it was enough to pay my rent. I could eat at the club. Mm -hmm. um, I was singing many obscure Rogers and Hart and Quote Porter and Jerome Kern. And, I mean, they had never heard that before. It was a private club, very snooty. But they did give me a little button to switch on when I got up to sing, which gave me a little spotlight. Oh. So, a bit like Marilyn Monroe, in uh -huh. bus stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was that, um, is the word cabaret singer appropriate here? No. No, okay. A cabaret singer gives a performance. Uh huh. I didn't give a performance, I sang with a band. Okay. You know. Yeah. Which was as it should be. I was starting out. It was the mm -hmm. best experience. You know. Right. And again, what kind of tunes would that particular band have been doing? Oh, um, I've got five dollars, and uh, you know all the all the great standards mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. When was your first chance to? Uh, record? When I went to Paris, I was living in Paris, and uh, Moody, James Moody, had written a tune with no words, which was kind of prophetic in a way, yeah. because I've sung many songs without words. And it was called Le Vent Vert, and that was the very first time I ever made a record. Did you set the words to it? No, or did you it just, was you just you just ooh. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ooh. And so it was a it was a um, uh, single record, the A and a B side. Yep. Yep. Seventy eight. Was a seventy eight. Yeah. Did you like the way it came out? Oh, you were like in heaven, right? Yeah. <laughs> With James Moody. You know, that yeah. I had just heard Things to Come, mm -hmm. Dizzy Gillespie's tune. And that hit me like a freight train. I didn't know what was going on. It went by like a bullet train. I'd never heard musicians play like that. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I was acquiring my knowledge of Dizzy's band, and uh, not so much Basie's band, because that came later, but all the great musicians, and, mm -hmm. and many of them were in Paris, you know, because of the exodus of the black musicians yeah. to Paris for the acceptance of their music. And, you know, it was Kenny Clark and uh, Don Bias and Rex Stewart and 
On and on and on. There were some good clubs in Paris for these fellows to play in, wasn't yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah, there were, especially on the left bank. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a wonderful opening of my ears and being in the company of those people. Mm -hmm. And I loved them and they loved me because I loved their music. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd sing down chords and get me to sing down chords and, you know, so I would get the harmonics and all that. And uh, it was joyous. It's a great time. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Plus you were making contacts for for years to come, right? Well, there was Dizzy, there was mm -hmm. Bird, you know, there was Clifford Brown, who didn't come over there, but I, when I sang with the Hampton Band, our trumpet section was Art Farmer, Clifford Brown, and Quincy Jones. That's not too shabby. Yeah. <laughs> that was um, around the early 50s? With, yeah. with Hampton? Yeah, very early. Yeah, 51, I think, if, if, if my notes are correct at all. And uh, a vocalist in front of a big band, is it um, taxing? I don't uh, like it. Yeah. I feel too restricted. Uh huh. I'd much rather sing with the quartet, maybe piano, bass, drums, and guitar, mm -hmm. or... I love flutes and saxophones. Mm -hmm. and, um, there are some people who are brilliant at it. I don't feel I'm one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Williams was, I mean, Sarah, any singer. But I, I felt looser when I was with the smaller mm -hmm. um, Tell me how the um, farmer's market and that whole thing came about? Well, necessity is the mother of invention, uh -huh. and the necessity was money. I knew George Wallington's wife, who, you know, he was the piano player with the Lionel Hampton band when I joined. He joined as well, and uh, she took me down to see a man called Bob Weinstein, who owned Prestige Records, which was a very popular record, a record label for young artists, well, Miles and people like that, um, who would be paid and who would sell their song and be very happy to sell it because it meant money in the hand. Um, I met him, Moody's Mood had just come out, and he said to me, do you know Moody's Mood? I said, yeah. He said, uh, do you think you could write words to an instrumental like mm -hmm. uh, Eddie Jefferson did? Eddie having done Moody's Mood for Love, not King Pleasure. Right. So I said, yeah. I mean, if he'd asked me if I could fly, I would have said yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he said, well, Here's a pile of records. Go back to your place. Pick one. Write the words. When you're ready, come to me. Well, I was living, I was sharing a floor. Um, I had a room in this big building where you shared the kitchen, you shared the bathroom, and it was... Ugh. <laughs> And so I was there the next morning with Twisted. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I hurried up and wrote those words. <laughs> <laughs> I got out of that place. Oh, uh, and that the, the the tenor player, refresh memory, was Wardell Gray. Wardell was the one who yeah. wrote the tune. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How did the initial Idea. Idea come from that. From the title. Yeah. Twisted. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would that be? And then I looked at myself. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I write, I write very fast. Uh -huh. I'm very lazy. I really, you know, I should be much more productive mm -hmm. than I am. But I. But when necessity. Take my time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When necessity calls, I really get to work. So I guess uh, Mr. Weinstein liked it. He was pretty surprised, uh -huh. yeah. And the next thing I knew, we recorded it. Uh huh. And it worked. Well, I recorded it and I left immediately for France. And while I was, no, I wasn't, I didn't leave for France. I went to Scotland to kind of see my family. And uh, while I was there, I was notified that uh, I'd been awarded the new Star Award for Downbeat for doing Twisted. And I thought, well, that's nice, you know. Mm -hmm. But my mind wasn't really that attuned to uh, staying in America. And then I eventually came back and I started to get work, which then led me to the Lionel Hampton Band. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had that backwards in my head. The Twisted came before the Hampton Band. Oh, it did? Yes, okay. Oh, yeah. So you got, um, the Hampton thing was not like your actual choice of your musical background that you'd work with, but what kind of tunes would you do with him? Would you be scatting with him and all that kind of thing? Nope. Uh, it's, there's a very interesting book about Clifford Brown that came out about six months ago. And it explains it well because, you know, we went to Sweden and Norway and Denmark and all around. What I didn't know was that Hamp had been told to bring a lady blues singer, not white. And I didn't know this, and I had my two numbers. I, was, I sang Twisted, and I forget what else, but I was not received well. Uh-huh. And uh, it was wrong. It was not good for the people who were involved because uh, at that time, there were two factions in European jazz. There was Charles Delaunay, who had the Hot Club of France. Mm -hmm. There was Hugh Panassier, who had the equivalent of the Hot Club, but it was a Dixieland. They were Dixieland bands. And Louis Armstrong did not like Bob. And later he changed, and we recorded with him, Lambert Henderson Ross. But at the time, there was a big faction in Europe about moldy figs and right. uh, how do you understand this new bebop thing and <laughs> it's not music and it doesn't make people tap their feet and be happy and uh, all this. So because of that, my services were no longer required. Mm. And when I left, George Wallington left. Oh. We had some good times. <laughs> <laughs> well, where would a, the big band, what camp is that going to fall in? That's going to fall in the, the bebop camp, isn't it? Well, some the, the band did. The yeah. arrangements did. Uh -huh. But Hamp could still go out and play blues, you know. And uh, then you had wonderful soloists like Art Farmer yeah. and like Brownie. So... But they wanted a, they wanted a blues shouter, and I'm not that. Uh -huh. So what did you decide after that? Back to New York and no, I stayed in <clears throat> Paris for quite a while. Um, then I came back. Then I went to the. I just kind of went all over the place, mm -hmm. and uh, did some gigs in America, and then. 
I went back to London and I I was in a show called Cranks with Anthony Newley who wrote some very good songs mm -hmm. and three other guys and we were a big hit in London and then we brought it to New York and it didn't work and I didn't want to go back to London and I happened to meet Dave Lambert, who introduced me to John Hendricks, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how Sing a Song with Basie yeah. came about. Uh, that is quite an amazing recording. Of course, it's pretty well documented, but... It still stands It's, right? it's mind-boggling. It, it, was it an arduous process? No. It happened so quickly. Uh, the fact that they had hired uh, session singers who didn't swing. <laughs> I mean, they could hit all the notes and it was all beautifully precise and all that, but they didn't swing. And they didn't have the capacity to swing, mm -hmm. you know? And I got a call from Dave to say, come down here and we got six women, six men, and the women, I want you to come down and give them the basic feel. Well, I just started to laugh. I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I went down, I did whatever I could, and it didn't work, and the money had been spent, and the producer was tearing his hair out, and finally Dave Lambert said, I have an idea. Let's multi-track. And I didn't know what he was talking about. But I said, yeah, that's monkey track. <laughs> and we learned the harmonies uh -huh. in about, oh, an hour. And we laid the first track down. And then we sharpened up the second part and laid that down. The minute I heard the two together, I knew we had some <laughs> magic. And it was a, a labor of love, yeah. really. I have a, uh, a quote here about that particular thing from uh, CD Guide to Jazz. It says, uh, Miss Ross has, has a particular genius for the sound of trumpets. Her section work is remarkable, full of growls, shakes, and percussive blasts. Her version of Buck Clayton and Joe Newman solos are remarkable. Oh. That's nice. That's pretty nice. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. Uh-huh. A lot of fun. Was there a decision after this record was over? It's like this is a this is a trio right here. Um again I left for Europe. <laughs> <laughs> When it came out, the, there's a nice story about when I came home after the session with a tape, and I called Miles, and I said, what do you think of this? And four bars, and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, Mingus, pick up the phone. And Mingus picked up the extension, and that was it. I mean, they just, you know, I wanted confirmation mm -hmm. and also to let them hear what was going on. And I knew I was right. I knew I was right. And when they went crazy, you know, that was it. That's a good story. Yeah. You're holding the, the phone to the speaker. Yeah. <laughs> A little tape recorder. Yeah. A portable tape recorder. Uh -huh. wasn't even a, you know. With the reels, right? This was a reel-to-reel -reel tape. No, this was a regular little, as my mind recalls it, it was a regular little tape that they had done in the studio. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, it seems to me you must not have had a lot of uh, possessions because you moved around no. so much. I left full apartments with full fridges yeah. 
you know, food in the fridge and everything. Just, whoosh. Mm. I did that when I went with Hap, because I was singing at a place called The Bandbox, and I had Max on drums and Tommy Potter on bass and Ernie Henry on alto and George on piano. And Hap was at Birdland next door. I was at a club called The Bandbox. And uh, Hap came in and he called me over and he said, hey, you want to go to Europe? And I said, yeah. With the band? I said, yeah. I said, when? He said, tomorrow. And that was it. That was another apartment gone. <laughs> Meanwhile, did your your family able to follow your oh bits your and exploits? pieces? Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm a terrible correspondent. Yeah. I never wrote. Uh huh. But uh, I was too busy having a good time. Mm -hmm. Well, Lambert Hendricks and Ross did. Uh, let's see, about six years you guys were together. I don't know. I think so. <laughs> Five or six. Did you have a favorite? Recording, besides Sing a Song of Basie? Oh, well, yeah, I have many. Mm -hmm. I loved Sing Along mm -hmm. with Basie because we were with Joe and the yeah. band. Um, the hottest new group in jazz, you know. And I loved High Flying, mm -hmm. which didn't get that much Distribution. It's a good album. Yeah. And those things of Randy Weston's are wonderful. How was the um, rehearsal process for those tunes? It was called Doing It As You Did It. We never, you know, <laughs> we would get together. I'd walk in with that many newspapers. I was a newspaper freak. John would be doing a crossword puzzle. Dave would be putting things on paper and voicing uh -huh. at Dave's little apartment in the village. And he'd say, okay, let's try this. And we'd put everything aside and we'd go up and we'd rehearse for maybe an hour. And then we'd have a party. And it was like, you know, we, it's like musicians who play a song so much that they want to see how fast they can play it and still be coherent. Mm -hmm. And we did our rehearsing, really, and our polishing by doing it. Uh -huh. Did you guys have a um, typical assignment as far as voicing yeah. Well, I was usually the trumpet mm -hmm. or the piano, and John was the tenor sax, and Dave was the trombone. So now when I work with John, I have to occasionally do another instrument. Yeah. You know, because it ain't as easy with two. Yeah. But it works out. Mm-hmm. Curious if the uh, albums that you guys did, were you happy with a financial return? No. Hmm. No. See, in those days, we didn't know about lawyers. Yeah. And we didn't know about you consult your lawyer before you sign yeah. anything. So, uh, no, wasn't happy with that. Mm -hmm. But, hey. The music was so great. Music what came great. out of it? Yeah. Money couldn't buy. Uh huh. That's for sure. It it kept your writing skills pretty sharp. A little. Yeah. <laughs> I left most of it to John. Yeah. Um. But it was a wonderful thing because. It wasn't founded by any one person. It was the three of us mm -hmm. as one. So you were you were quite hard to replace. 
I would have to say that. Wow. That's a hard gig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. It's great stuff. You had done, um, were you doing a few solo albums at the same time? Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, one with um, Jerry Mulligan. Mm hmm Now, that's a good match for you, I think. Yeah, and yeah. Zoot. Yeah. I love that. I, you know, records or CDs or whatever you want to call them, I like children. You know, it's very hard to find, you maybe have a sentimental favorite because of everything that it involved. But it's very hard to choose one particular one mm -hmm. that you say is the best for you. Because I think all of them have something. Well, post Lambert Hendricks and Ross. Yeah. Yeah. Did some more um, theater. I did uh, some wonderful theater mm -hmm. in London. Um, I did Kennedy's Children, which was a wonderful play. I did uh, Jenny, the betrayer in Three Penny Opera with mm -hmm. Vanessa Redgrave. Um, I've done all kinds. You know, if I couldn't work anymore and couldn't sing anymore, I could always go into the theater and be a wonderful dresser, you know, dress people for uh -huh. their parts, because I know how to do all that. Mm -hmm. And stage managing and, you know, I've had a really good grounding mm -hmm. in that. You, and one is an extension of the other. Uh -huh. You know, acting is singing, singing is acting. What do you listen to at home these days? Anything in particular? Um, you know, it's very funny because I love talk radio because it's immediate. And, and I love things like Jeopardy on television, because I like to, I learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. And when I play music, I play Ahmad Jamal, or Gene Harris, or Zoot, or Zoot Now, or Dizzy, or Miles, you know, yeah. all the Hawk, good stuff as well as, uh, you know, South American mm -hmm. things. Do you have uh, vocalists that you, you still love, that you listen to on the way up, and who were they? Well, it was, you know, the greats. It mm -hmm. was Lady, Sassy, Dinah, Ella. It seemed to me there were a whole lot of really individual singers mm -hmm. at that time. It's finding your own voice, you know. Um, there are a lot of singers today, and there are some very good singers today. Uh, but they don't have that stamp of individuality as much now. I mean, Ernestine Anderson, Shirley Horn. I mean, those are some wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. singers. Irene, excuse me, Irene Reed, who was with the Basie Band as a singer and has become a very great friend of mine for a long time. Uh, very underrated, should be heard, you know? deserves to be heard. But I, I must say, nothing moves me as much as those other ladies. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard that comment um, before, but mostly applied to instrumentalists. And I'm wondering why that is. Well, they were innovators. First of all, there'll never be another Sweets. 
There'll never be another dizzy, it'll never be another bird. You know, those are giants. Yeah. Those are in not inventors, but oh, I'm trying to think of a word where they were innovators. They got their own thing going. I mean, I think for singers, when you're young, and I'm talking about 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you listen to a lot of singers because you love the way they sound, and through osmosis almost, you are influenced by them, and, and maybe you try to sound like them. But then you have to move away from that and find your own voice. Mm -hmm. So when someone hears you, you can say, oh, that's so-and-so, you know? And like I say, what I listen to is those real individual ones. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather hear, I'd rather hear Lady sing. Well, my favorite album is Lady in Satin, because there's a whole life in that voice. Yeah, that was fairly near the end, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that was Lady's favorite. Mm hmm You know, it doesn't matter that the notes weren't all crystal, pristine. Nah. Yeah. Because the feeling was there. And that's the important thing. If you'll humor me for a minute, when you mentioned Sweets, reminded me about a couple particular tunes I wanted to ask about, and one was a Centerpiece. How did that come to be? It just came to be <laughs> like it was supposed to. I mean, Sweets came in, John had written the words, you know, there's a wonderful story about uh, when we did sing a song. We got to the gig, to the, you know, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was. We had, I think it took two sessions where we brought the instrumentalists in. And we showed up and we had Sonny Payne and Eddie Jones, Nat Pierce doing Basie, and suddenly there was Freddie Jones on guitar. Freddie Green, you mean? Fre no, Freddie Jones. Freddie Jones, the guitar player with Basie. Yeah. And we said, what are you doing here? I mean, the budget. He said, what? What budget? He said, I even brought my old guitar that I played on those original oh. records. I mean, it was like that, you know. That's but with, <laughs> with Sweets, you know, or, or with Louis Armstrong, when we did that album with Louis. And uh, he, you know, to have Armstrong come in and say, Annie, teach me how to hit those notes. You know, yeah. all the money in the world could not pay for those moments. Mm. That's really touching. Well, I've been blessed, yeah. you know, to, to have known them. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I got to Paris, there was Willie the Lion Smith, there was Bechet. There was uh, Big Chief Russell Moore, who played the tuba. There were a lot of people that were much older than I was, but we connected, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's called Open Up Your Ears and Listen, because like I told you about the one part of the music people hated what they called moldy figs, mm -hmm. and the other loved bebop. 
And I was sharing an apartment with Mary Lou Williams in Paris. And she said, I'm going to take you down, let you hear Sidney Boucher. And I said, Sidney Boucher, oh, he's that old guy. To... <laughs> and boy, she laid into me. She said, don't you ever be that ignorant. She said, we're going to go down there, and you're going to hear Sidney Boucher. And we went down, and we heard Sidney Boucher, and was my face red. I mean, it. he just swung so much. And I, and you know, I dismissed him just, mm -hmm. and you shouldn't do that, because I hadn't heard him, you know. And you don't make a comment like that about somebody that you don't know. Uh huh. Well said. Did did um, the three of you ever have any problems with John being black and you know? Only in the city of brotherly love. Oh. <laughs> uh, and and Dave Lambert saved John because the police there were very heavy at the time. John was going with a lady who's now his wife, mm -hmm. who happened to be white, and they were looking to take him out and beat him up. Mm. And Dave could hear it and immediately came down and said, you're not taking him anywhere. Nowhere. But that was the only time. Uh, we opened on a tour in, what's it, El Paso? But it was somewhere in Texas, and we were going to be in a boxing ring. Well, I've sung in a boxing ring in Paris. There used to be a club called uh, The Ringside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was when Sugar Ray Robinson was in town, and he would give, you know, oh, exhibits, yeah. et cetera. And, uh, so we told Basie, and he, he said, come here. He took me aside and he said, don't go. And I said, why? He said, you're going to be in Texas. You are going to be in a boxing ring. You're going to have people all around you. And because of you and John and Dave, you could get hurt. But we went. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. Hmm. Something must have happened to him down there for him well, to say that. Well, yes, of course, yeah. early on, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And he was wonderful. Mm. What a man, huh? Oh, teddy bear. Yeah. A teddy bear. Do you remember when... Um, if you guys had a reaction when he did the song Cloud Burst, like, wow, that's really something. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we would get that. Anything that we did uh -huh. was an incredible reaction. Well, we always... You know, there were numbers that are real crowd pleasers, yeah. like Cloud Burst. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it, it then became a question of, well, how fast can we sing it? <laughs> and they can still understand the words. <laughs> I think some of that, that particular record is one of my favorites, and there's some very intricate things yeah. happening, and uh, I guess I just picture, you know, arduous rehearsals, you know, and... Nah. Nah. <laughs> no, no, no. I guess not that much different from the way instrumentalists talk, you know, about going into the studio and, and doing an album with, in the same kind of relying on your ears and mm. your musicality. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. You gotta have ears. Well, it'll save you every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you look back... Um, but, you know, it, that's why it kills me when I hear about the Beatles took four years to do an album. Come on. 
It couldn't have been all rehearsal and all, you know. Uh -huh. You were lucky if you got two days mm -hmm. to do it. And I'm sure in the beginning, in some cases, one day, one night, all night. But when you got a good thing going, you know, you want to keep the momentum. Mm -hmm. If you look back on the, uh, the time since then, is there a, a, a favorite thing that you were doing, the theater? Would that have been the... No. My heart is singing. Mm -hmm. And will always be. Yeah. But there were wonderful moments in each of the things that I did. Mm -hmm. You know, the opening night of Free Penny Opera in London was phenomenal. But then there's Sing a Song or Basic, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Now, and all this analytical stuff about jazz. Uh-huh. What do you think about that? Not a lot. Uh-huh. Jazz is feeling. It's feeling. It has nothing to do with color. You know, we know that it is a black music. But you can't dismiss a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's not about that. It's about love and giving and joy and enrichment. I never had a problem with that. I hope that statement goes in your book. If I can remember it. <laughs> <laughs> you call me, I'll help you out. <laughs> okay. How's that progressing? Pretty well? The, you... Yeah. It's, it's almost like solving a puzzle. Because I've lived a long time. I'm 70. Mm -hmm. I have had many experiences. And I'll remember something and I'll write it. And I'll go on to something else. And because I'm trying to do it chronologically, it's the only kind of way I know how. And then I'll think, oh, yeah, but that happened then. Mm -hmm. So you have to go back. And because I've never written a book, I've written a cookbook. But I, that's not the same thing as writing your autobiography. And I feel that I have found my voice in writing. Because when I talk to people about, uh, well, like publishers and people like that, about uh, I want to do it on my own, I don't want to have a ghostwriter. And they would say, well, you, yes, I think you probably have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. But writing it now, as opposed to a year ago, when I thought about it and started it, I suddenly found, ah, right. That's the way to put it down. And it's my way of putting it down. Mm -hmm. And I believe, hopefully, I found my voice, you know. No. <laughs> I can't imagine you haven't, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah. I want it to be informative and funny. And there are sad bits, but that's life. Mm -hmm. But to share some of the scenes that I've had, which are wonderful. I'd like others to feel the same and enjoy it. Well, I look forward to it, and I want to thank you for your time this oh. evening. This was most enjoyable. And it was enjoyable for me. Good, I'm glad. And uh, best of luck with your book and uh, the you. upcoming Blue Note engagement. Yeah. <laughs>
Tuesday night. You got a whole. That'll uh, be fun. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. Give me another excuse to come back. Absolutely. <laughs> well, listen. Thank you so much again, and uh, I mostly appreciate it. Oh, I've had a good time. Good. Thank you.